Let's turn our Bibles to the book of Hebrews, Hebrews chapter 13, Hebrews chapter 13. I'm going to preach from the very first verse in the Bible that I memorized after I got saved back in 1971. Hebrews chapter 13, and that verse is number 8. Jesus Christ, the same yesterday and today and forever. Let's pray. Father, we come to you now in the name of the Lord Jesus, and I plead with you this morning that you would fill me with the Holy Ghost of God, that as I preach, your word would go forth in power. Father, you know every individual that's here. You know their hearts. You know who has trusted Jesus Christ as Savior and who has lost. You know of those that have trusted Christ as Savior who has backslidden on God, who is right with God, who's growing in their faith. And Father, I pray today that you would have something in this message to stir up each one. For the lost, may they see their need clearly for Jesus, and may they come to Christ today and be saved. Lord, for Christians that have become cold and backslidden on God, I pray the Spirit of God would convict their heart of their need to be right with this one who is eternally the same. And Lord, we'll thank you for what you do in every heart today, for we ask it in Jesus' name. Amen. We live in an absolute, rapidly changing world. If you just think back 20 years, all the things... 20 years ago, we were listening to 8-track tapes. 20 years ago, only rich people talked on a mobile phone in their car. No one had one in their purse or in their pocket. 20 years ago. 20 years ago, kids still knew what a record player was. 20 years ago. It's amazing. My daughter a while back got a phone for a room. She thought it was really neat. It had uh, a round dial thing. You got a dial like this. She thought that was so cute. (laughs) And most of us can remember when we couldn't wait to get rid of those things. And it had one of those rings. Now you hear the Ponderosa theme or whatever else is going on. Times have changed. I remember the first time I went to Uganda, it amazed me. I got to Uganda within a day from the time that I left. And I remember stories of the great missionaries like C.T. Studd and David Livingston. It took them months to get where I got in one day. Times have dramatically changed. You can contact people. No matter where you're at, on the street, you can contact people by way of your cell phone on the other side of the world and carry on a conversation with no delay whatsoever. The change has been absolutely dramatic. Do you know there was a person that made a statement in the U.S. Patent Office over a hundred years ago that he guaranteed within five years that there would be no new inventions, there would be nothing left to invent? I'll guarantee you he wished for a long time he'd never made that statement. Now, if we continue at the same rate, it is really scary. But all of the inventions, many unfortunately, are used for wickedness. We have found more ways to kill people. Amazing ways to kill people. Well, they've got bombs now you can drop on a place that will only kill people and not hurt the buildings. That's amazing, isn't it? We are so concerned about that. Some of the things that are taking place in our nation are changes that are dramatically for the worse. Violence abounds. We like to accent all that takes place over in Iraq because we've got troops there. And yet we can name a number of cities in America that had more people killed in the city limits of that city in the last year than Americans that were killed in Iraq, the entire country. It's absolutely amazing. So much sex on TV today. It used to be you had to go to a place of great wickedness in order to view the things that people see in their own homes today by way of the TV or the Internet. Isn't it really sad when the living rooms of homes, and unfortunately even many so-called professing Christian homes, are more filthy and wicked in what they allow in their homes than those dens of iniquity 50 years ago? But that's where we've come. 
We live in an age where abortion on demand is expected as a right. And I'll guarantee you if the founding fathers had ever envisioned anything like that happened in America, they would have put it in there. No, it's not allowed. They knew it was wrong to kill babies in the womb or out of the womb. Amen. Young people are taught that sex is just another bodily function and there's no morals to it. And they're taught that not just by Planned Parenthood. They're taught that by Hollywood. They're taught that by the TV and every other thing that comes out today. And you try to teach them the Bible standards and they think, well, what tree did you crawl out under? The truth is we didn't come from under tree. People who teach that sex is just another bodily function to be treated like any other bodily function that takes place. There's no morals to it whatsoever. Those are the people that believe you came out from under a tree. And are they going to be shocked when they stand before God one day? Amen. Meanwhile, the pastors have become corrupt. They use perverted Bibles in the pulpit. There's nothing wrong with the old King James Bible. Matter of fact, it's the only one that has everything right with it. It's the only one that includes everything God wrote. It's the only one that was verbally translated, where they took the words of God and translated, and they didn't leave out a bunch of verses and part of verses. They put it all in there because they believed what Jesus said in Matthew chapter 4 when He said, Man shall not live by bread alone, but by every word that proceedeth out of the mouth of God. I read a story yesterday about another new Bible that is causing controversy. Well, the reason they want to keep writing a new Bible is they don't like what this one says. They don't like God's do's and don'ts. But God still means them. Amen. And you can walk into church after church today that one time majored on preaching the Word of God and preaching the gospel of Jesus Christ. And today it's just another psychology session to make you feel better about yourself. Pulpits have become perverted in the land. It's become so watered down that you remember in the last primary election, Alabama was voting on an amendment to define marriage between a man and a woman. That's what it is. That's what it's always been. And I don't care what you try to say it being something else. It's still only between a man and a woman. And I don't care if you pass a law saying same-sex marriage is all right. It's still wrong in the eyes of God. Amen. So we had a major rally. I happen to live in Limestone County. We had a major rally in Limestone County up in, at the Limestone County Courthouse. We had preachers from several different uh, groups that were there. Now, you'd think this would be a major thing. We have an opportunity to make a statement to preserve the morality of a nation and preserve at least the biblical teaching that is foundational to all society. And with all the preachers that were there, only 400 people show up, 250 of them out of Madison Baptist Church. It's in Madison County. Man, we had a couple of preachers that came from churches that ran over a thousand, and together they couldn't put 50 people on the town square. Brother, you talk about being gone. Times have definitely changed. You go back to the Scopes Monkey Trial, and they had more Christians out for that every day than what we could get on a town square where churches are filled up on Sunday morning in different places, but they could care less about standing for righteousness publicly. Times are changing. But in the midst of all that, now I got you fighting, Matt. I got Brother Boris' blood boiling already. I want to say that on the 23rd anniversary of Madison Baptist Church, that God hadn't changed. Amen. Jesus hasn't changed. The Word of God hasn't changed. Right and wrong hasn't changed. God's commands have not changed. And by the grace of God in 23 years, the preaching at Madison Baptist Church hasn't changed. And by the grace of God, it won't change. I want you to look at that verse again. He said, Jesus Christ, the same yesterday and today and forever. Beloved, if there's anything we need today, it's a return to the old-time religion. I don't want just a little bit of the old-time religion. Back in August, I went to Scotland for the first time. We went to a little place called Burnt Island. Now, it's not an island, it's on the, it's, but it's near the coast of Scotland. 
And as we went to that place, there is a church there where the King James Bible was commissioned by King James the Sixth of Scotland, who became King James the First of England. While we're walking through that church, it's an active church, people still meet there today. The man who was showing us around, we asked him, we said, do they still preach from the King James Bible here? He said, we read from it once a year. We read from it. Of course, no preaching goes on any time from anything there. So I want to say some things today about this verse and about the truth of this. Because it's a powerful statement. You know, Madison Avenue is always looking for that statement that will grab people. Like, Aflac! Isn't that right? They're looking for that one thing that as soon as you hear it, brother, you already are familiar with it. Well, God's got a statement here that is so plain and says so much within it, it puts all statements that Madison Avenue's ever put together, it puts them all to shame. Jesus Christ, the same yesterday and today and forever. Now, because that's true, that tells me some things. Number one, it tells me that God hasn't changed because Jesus is God. John chapter 1, verse 1, In the beginning was the Word, and the Word uh, was with God, and the Word was God. Verse 14, And the Word was made flesh and dwelt among us, and we beheld His glory as of the only begotten of the Father, full of grace and truth. Now, when did the Word uh, get made flesh? When he came to this earth in the person of Jesus Christ, that's why he told his disciples in John chapter 14 and verse 9, when Philip said, Lord, show us the Father and it sufficeth us. And the Bible says, Jesus answered and said unto him, Have I been so long time with you, and yet thou hast not known me, Philip? He that has seen me has seen the Father. How sayest thou then, show us the Father? In First John chapter 5 and verse 20, I want you to turn there for this one. Just before we get to the book of Revelation, you got First John, Second John, Third John, Jude, and Revelation. In First John chapter five, look at verse twenty. The Scripture is plain, and we know that the Son of God is come, and hath given us an understanding that we may know Him that is true, and we are in Him that is true, even in His Son Jesus Christ. Get this: this is the true God. And eternal life. Who's true God? The Son, Jesus Christ. He's God. In the Old Testament, in Isaiah chapter 43, beginning in verse 10, the Scripture says, Ye are my witnesses, saith the Lord, and my servants whom I have chosen, that ye may know and believe me, and understand that I am He. Before me there was no God formed, neither shall there be after me. I, even I, am the Lord. Now get this. And beside me... There is no Savior. You got that? He's, God says, I, even I, am the Lord, and beside me there is no Savior. Titus 2.13 says, Looking for the blessed hope and the glorious appearing of our great God and Savior, Jesus Christ. Amen. Jesus Christ is God. Isaiah 9, 6, Unto us a child is born, unto us a son is given, and the government shall be upon his shoulders, and his name shall be called Wonderful Counselor, the Mighty God, the Everlasting Father, the Prince of Peace. Well, who's the Prince of Peace? Jesus. Yeah, He's also the Mighty God. He's also the everlasting Father. That's who He is. He is equal with God because He has all the attributes of God. He is God. He still knows all. The psalmist said in Psalm 139, verse 4, There's not a word in my tongue, but lo, O Lord, Thou knowest it altogether. Thou hast beset me behind and before, and hast laid Thine hand upon me. Such knowledge is too wonderful for me. He says, God, you even know the words that I want to say that I don't say. And you know the words even before I say them. You know everything that's in my tongue. He knows all things. Not only that, He's everywhere. He's as if I say, surely the darkness shall uh, cover me, even the night shall be light about me. The darkness hideth not from thee, for the night shineth as the day. The darkness and the light are both alike to thee. He sees us no matter where we're at, no matter what we do. Matter of fact, all power 
is in Jesus Christ. As he said in Matthew chapter 28 and verse 20, he said, all or verse 18, all power is given unto me in heaven and in earth. And I want you to get this. God's still the same. God is still holy. I'll say that again. God is still holy. There's a whole lot of folks today because they go to perverted churches that have this idea that somehow God changed from the New Testament, or from the Old Testament to the New Testament. God didn't change a bit. He's still the same. Malachi 3, 6, For I am the Lord, I change not. Psalm 99 and verse 9, Exalt the Lord our God and worship at His holy hill, for the Lord our God is holy. Isaiah 57, 17, or 57, 15, Thus saith the high and lofty one that inhabiteth eternity, whose name is holy. Let me show you something. Turn over to the book of Isaiah. Isaiah chapter 6. In Isaiah chapter 6, Isaiah gets a vision of heaven. He sees God high and lifted up, the Bible says. And he sees some angels flying in the presence of God. I want you to look at Isaiah chapter 6 and verse 3. For the Scripture says, And one cried unto another and said, Holy, holy, holy is the Lord of hosts. The whole earth is full of His glory. Now, you got that vision. We're talking about 700 years before Christ was born. Isaiah gets a vision of heaven. He sees the seraphim flying in the presence of God. They're not crying, love, love, love. God is love. He is love, by the way. They're not calling grace, grace, grace. God is gracious, and He surely is gracious. They're crying, holy, holy, holy. The whole earth is full of His glory. Well, you turn over to the book of Revelation. Turn there, if you would, please. Last book of the Bible. Revelation chapter 4. In Revelation chapter 4, some 70 years, 60 to 70 years after Jesus went to the cross of Calvary, the apostle John gets a view of heaven. This is going to be 800 years after Isaiah saw heaven. 60 years after Jesus went to the cross of Calvary. And now we've got the Apostle John being ushered into heaven. And look what goes on, beginning in verse 8. And the four beasts had each of them six wings about him, and they were full of eyes within. And they rest not day and night, saying, Holy, 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 Lord God Almighty, which was and is and is to come. Do you see that the attribute of God that they're still crying out at the throne of God today is holy, holy, holy. He's a holy God. I want you to understand something. You don't have a clue what love even means and what it means when the Scripture says God is love until you first realize that He is holy. Because only when you realize He is holy can you even begin to understand how much it took Him to go to the cross and be made sin for us. You see, it's in Romans chapter 1 and verse 18. Where the Scripture says, For the wrath of God is revealed from heaven against all ungodliness and unrighteousness of men who hold the truth and unrighteousness. Now, let's stop here for just a moment. That's a New Testament verse. That's written after Jesus went to the cross of Calvary. You'll go into church today where they, churches today where they won't even mention sin. They don't want to talk about it. That's negative. They don't want to talk about that. It's negative. I got news for you. You take the negative off your battery, you don't have a battery. You gotta have the negative or the positive doesn't work. Amen. Here, we find in Romans 1.18, for the wrath of God is, not was, is revealed from heaven against all ungodliness and unrighteousness of men who hold the truth and unrighteousness. He still hates sin. Now, guess what? Because of all that, he still commands man to repent. Now, I know Hollywood makes fun of this. They think this is a silly word. But Paul didn't think it was a silly word. When he was preaching at Mars Hill in Acts chapter 17 and verse 30, he said, In the times of this ignorance, God winked at, but now commandeth, not suggest, not thinks it's a good idea, but now commandeth all men everywhere to repent, because God hath appointed a day in which He will judge the world in righteousness. Now, you can count on that. That's the New Testament message today. 
And as Malachi 3, 6 says again, For I am the Lord, I change not. You see, we come back to this verse in Hebrews chapter 13. Jesus Christ, the same yesterday and today and forever. It says Jesus hasn't changed. And one of the reasons we know that is because He is God and God doesn't change. And He is God, therefore He doesn't change either. Not only that, His Word hasn't changed. I've already said something about the Word of God. But let me have you turn to this passage. For those of you who are just eager to get a hold of another Bible that says something different than this one. Turn to the book of Matthew, chapter 5. You realize in the last hundred years, there's been almost 100 so-called new English translations of the Bible. Every time, it's so that it'll be written in our language and we can understand it. When the NIV came out, the idea was so we can understand what the Bible says. But now they've come out with a new NIV. Are they saying they failed with the first NIV? Well, the truth is they did fail with the first one. They failed with the second one, too. You didn't need it. This is the international version right here. I like that, Brother Boy. That's pretty good. Amen. Look at chapter 5, verse 17. Jesus said, Think not that I am come to destroy the law of the prophets. I am not come to destroy, but to fulfill. For verily I say unto you, till heaven and earth pass, one jot or one tittle shall in no wise pass from the law till all be fulfilled. Now, there's prophecies about the second coming of Jesus that haven't taken place yet. So it's all still good, isn't it? Notice what he says, verse 19, Whosoever therefore shall break one of these least commandments and shall teach men so, he shall be called least in the kingdom of heaven. But whosoever shall do and teach them, the same shall be called great in the kingdom of heaven. John 17, 17, Jesus said, Thy word is truth. Psalm 119, 160, Thy word is true from the beginning, and every one of thy righteous judgments endureth forever. Psalm 119, verse 89, Forever, O Lord, thy word is settled in heaven. Jeremiah 23 and verse 29, The Scripture said, Is not my word like a fire, saith the Lord, and like a hammer that breaketh a rock in pieces? Psalm 119, 142, Thy word, thy law is truth. Psalm 119, 151, O Lord, all thy commandments are truth. Jesus believed it was true because it is true. It's His Word, and His Word does not change. And according to Jesus Christ, it is His Word that will judge us. According to John chapter 5, and I'm sorry, chapter 12 and verse 48, he's, uh, let's turn there, it done flew out of my mind. But thank God it hadn't flown out of my Bible. Amen. He that rejecteth me and receiveth not my words hath one that judgeth him. The word that I have spoken unto him, the same shall judge him in the last day. Think with me. If God's word hasn't changed, think with me now. If God's word hasn't changed, then hell is still real. You see, none of the teachings on hell have changed. Now, there are people who will teach on it, won't preach on it. But I'm going to tell you why. You say, well, that's not a message of love. Wait just a minute. If I go down to the beach and I'm thinking about going swimming, and there are sharks in the water, to me the message of love is no swimming. Sharks. You understand that? Getting the warning that will save my life. That's the message of love. Hey, God has given us a message that will keep us from going to hell in the Word of God because hell is still real. There is nobody in the Bible who said more about hell than Jesus Christ. And to Jesus Christ, it was real. He said in Matthew 25, 41, Then shall they say unto them on the left hand, Depart from me, ye cursed, into everlasting fire, prepared for the devil and his angels. Jesus is the one who told the story of the rich man and Lazarus. He says, and the, rich, and the beggar died, was carried by the angels into Abraham's bosom. The rich man also died and was buried. And in hell he lift up his eyes, being in torment, seeth Abraham afar off, and Lazarus in his bosom. And he cried and said, Father Abraham, have mercy upon me, and send Lazarus. They may dip the tip of his finger in water and cool my tongue, for I am tormented in this flame. I've had people tell me, well, you're not going to scare me into heaven with a message like that. Well, it scared me into heaven. I'm going to tell you why I got saved. I didn't want to go to hell. When I found out the Bible said I was a sinner in God's sight, 
I was lost and undone. It told me that Jesus died for my sins, was buried and rose three days later from the dead. And I found out that He was the only Savior, for He said, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No man comes to the Father but by Me. I said, buddy, if that's the only escape I got, I'm for sure taking it. I don't want to die and go to hell. I knew I was lost. I knew I was undone. And I saw Him as my only hope. I trusted Christ. Now, thank God, I learned to love Him after I got saved, after He gave me eternal life. But before that, it scared me out of hell. And if I can scare somebody here out of going to hell, why would you want to go to hell and burn forever? Well, preacher, I just don't think it's real. What if you're wrong? I mean, you think about it for a second. What if Jesus was wrong and I'm wrong? You trust Jesus, you've lost nothing. But if Jesus is right, and I'd say He knows a whole lot more about it than you do, and you hold to your thought about hell's not real because you heard somebody say it on TV one day, and you die without Christ and it's real, you've lost your soul for eternity. Jesus made it plain in John chapter 14 when He was talking to His disciples before He went to the cross. He said, In my Father's house are many mansions. If it were not so, I would have told you. He made it plain. I'm not telling you something to make you feel good. I'm telling you the truth. Matter of fact, Jesus said, And you shall know the truth, and the truth shall make you free. Jesus only spoke the truth. He gave us the reality of hell and the torments of hell. The Word of God explains it in Revelation 14, 11. He says, The smoke of their torment ascendeth forever and ever, and they have no rest day nor night. You see, if Jesus is the same and His Word is the same, that means hell is still real. And if you die without Jesus, that's where you go for eternity. By the way, it tells me something else. Right and wrong hasn't changed. Now, I understand the politician's not getting it, believe me. Because what becomes important to the elected official, for most of them, this wouldn't be all of them, but for most of them, is to get elected again. And what becomes right is whatever gets me elected again. I understand that. But I'm going to, I'm going to be frank with you. I don't have any respect for a person who calls himself a man of God who would get up and tell people who've come to hear what God says in His Word, for that man to lie to him and tell them somehow that that which God condemns is wrong in the Bible is all right for them to do today. Jesus hasn't changed. His Word hasn't changed. Right and wrong has not changed. You see, when He says in 1 Corinthians chapter 6, beginning in verse 9, when he says, Know ye not the unrighteous shall not inherit the kingdom of God, be not deceived, neither fornicators nor idolaters, nor adulterers, nor effeminate, nor abusers of themselves with mankind. That's the sodomite, by the way. Nor thieves, nor covetous, nor drunkards, nor revilers, nor extortioners shall inherit the kingdom of God. Now, that's pretty plain language right there. You know what that tells me? Adultery is still adultery. Drinkers are still drunkards. Premarital sex is still fornication. Abortion is still murder. Homosexuality is still sodomy and perversion. Marriage is still only between a man and a woman. Gambling is still a sin. And cursing is still vile and vulgar. Jesus has not changed. God has not changed. His Word has not changed. And something we all need to understand, man hasn't changed. He just has more expensive toys to play with. But he hadn't changed. You want to see what God says about you and me? Let's turn over to it. Go to Romans chapter 3. And let's see what God says about us. Romans chapter 3. Beginning in verse 10. He has quite a list here of what we all are like. For the Bible says there is none that doeth good. The Bible says there is not a just man upon the earth that doeth good and sinneth not. Look at verse 10. He says, as it is written, there is none righteous. No, not one. He's not just talking about those outside the church. He's talking about those in church. There are people think because they go to church, they're going to heaven. It'd be a terrible place. Die and go to hell from a church pew. 
He says, there's none that understand it. There's none that seeketh after God. They are all gone out of the way. They are together become unprofitable. There is none that doeth good. No, not one. Their throat is an open sepulcher. With their tongues they've used deceit. The poison of asp is under their lips, whose mouth is full of cursing and bitterness. Their feet are swift to shed blood. Boy, is that not true? Murder abounds. That's why Hollywood, that's how they can keep having these successful TV shows. What, what are they about? Murder. He goes on, destruction and misery are in their ways. The way of peace have they not known. There is no fear of God before their eyes. Now look at the very end of verse 22. He says, for there is no difference, as he wraps it up, notice the next verse, for all have sinned and come short of the glory of God. God looks down at mankind. He says, we've all sinned and we've all come short of His glory. Turn over a page or two to Romans chapter 8. And I want you to look at verse 8. You think you're a pretty good person, huh? He says, so then they that are in the flesh cannot please God. Why is that? Well, according to Isaiah chapter 64 and verse 6, he says, all our righteousnesses are as filthy rags. There are people who think they're going to heaven because they give to the church or they give to the poor or they give to UNICEF or they're basically a good person around Christmas time and give to toys for tots. And God says, they that are in the flesh cannot please God. Your fleshly birth isn't good enough to get you there. That's why Jesus told Nicodemus, except a man be born again, he cannot see the kingdom of God. He said, that which is born of the flesh is flesh, but that which is born of the Spirit is spirit. And then he said, do a marvel not, I said unto you, ye must be born again. You see, Jesus hasn't changed. And he lets us know that man hasn't changed. He still has that same need of being born again. That also tells us the way of salvation hasn't changed. Because Jesus hasn't changed, God hasn't changed, His Word hasn't changed, right and wrong hasn't changed, man hasn't changed, salvation is the same. I already quoted this verse, but I want you to get a hold of it. Think of it. Now, especially if you haven't been to church in a while or you haven't been the one to preach the Word of God, I want you to hear what Jesus said. If you want to check it out, it's in John chapter 14 and verse 6. Jesus said unto him, I am the way, the truth, and the life. Now, get this. No man comes to the Father but by me. There's only one way to get to the Father, and that is through Jesus Christ. That's why 1 Timothy chapter 2 and verse 5, there's one God and one mediator between God and men, the man Christ Jesus. That's why Peter was preaching in Acts 4.12, and he said, Neither is there salvation in any other, for there's none other name under heaven given among men whereby we must be saved. No other name. You can't get saved by Muhammad. You can't get saved by Buddha. None of the Hindu, the millions of Hindu gods can save you, and all of them together don't have the power to save you. There's only one who can save you, and that's Jesus Christ. Now, the Bible's plain about that. The way of salvation hasn't changed. You say, preacher, how can that be? Because He's the only one who could die for your sins at Calvary because He's the only one who's ever walked on this earth who never sinned. Knowing that a man is, uh, for as much as you know, I'm going to have to turn to it now. Turn over to 1 Peter chapter 1, verse 18. It's trouble when you get old. You forget. First, verse 18. For as much as you know that you were not redeemed with corruptible things as silver and gold from your vain tra uh, traditions received by your fathers, from your fathers, but by the precious blood of Christ, as of a lamb, get this, without blemish and without spot. Perfect. Sinless. Second Corinthians 5.21, For He, God, hath made Him, Jesus, to be sin for us who knew no sin, that we might be made the righteousness of God in Him. Jesus, absolutely perfect, went to the cross of Calvary. Romans chapter 5, beginning in verse 6. He tells us this. He tells us, For when we were yet without strength in due time, Christ died for the ungodly. For scarcely for a righteous man will one die, yet for adventure for a good man some would even dare to die. But God commended His love toward us in that while we were yet sinners, Christ died for us. He died in our place. He took my sin upon Himself at Calvary and paid for my sin. He paid for your sin so that you could go to heaven when you die. 
You say, well, preacher, what do I have to do? Glad you asked. Here's what, the, here's what Jesus said. John chapter 3 and verse 16, he said, For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten Son, that whosoever believeth on him should not perish, but have everlasting life. John 3, 36, he said, He that believeth on the Son hath everlasting life. He that believeth not the Son shall not see life, but the wrath of God abideth on him. He said, if you'll put all your trust in Jesus Christ alone to save you, he'll do it. The church can't save you. The preacher can't save you. The pope can't save you. Religion can't save you. Only Jesus Christ can save you. You must come to him. Your works can't help you. Only Jesus Christ's work at Calvary can help you. Nothing else. When he tells the church, go into all the world and preach the gospel to every creature, he then says, He that believeth and is baptized shall be saved, but he that believeth not shall be damned. Is Jesus Christ your Savior today? The one who is the same yesterday and today and forever, he is the same one that saves today just like he saved Paul on the Damascus road. Just like he saved the Philippian jailer in Acts chapter 16, the same one, Jesus Christ, is the only one who can save you. Salvation's not changed. That leads me to one other thing and we're done. Isn't that pleasant? His commands to Christians haven't changed. For instance, Matthew chapter 28 and verse 19, he told the disciples, Go ye therefore and teach all nations. Now get this baptizing them in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Ghost, teaching them to observe all things whatsoever I've commanded you. The first thing that Jesus commanded a person to do after they get saved is to be baptized. So on the day of Pentecost, when 3,000 people got saved, the Scripture says in verse 41 of Acts chapter 2, Then they that gladly received His word were baptized, and the same day there was added unto them 3,000 souls. You go to Acts chapter 10 and you find Peter winning a a Gentile man to the Lord by the name of Cornelius and winning his whole house. And the Bible says, and he commanded them to be baptized in the name of the Lord. It doesn't say he suggested they pray about it or think about it. You get born again, you're to get baptized. Jesus commanded it. That's why you do it. It doesn't save you. It doesn't make you any more saved or less saved. It's just simply being obedient to Jesus and the very first thing. Second thing is being faithful to a local church. Amen. You say, well, preacher, wait just a second. I just don't believe in that man-made religion. Oh, the local church isn't. It's a Jesus-made church. The Bible says, husbands, love your wives, even as Christ also, get this, loved the church and gave himself for it. He calls the church the bride of Christ in Ephesians chapter 5. In 1 Corinthians chapter 12, he calls the local assembly of believers the body of Christ. Everywhere the apostle Paul went in the book of Acts, when he won people to the Lord, he started a local church. You go to the last book of the Bible, Revelation is written to the seven churches of Asia Minor. Those were local churches. As a matter of fact, in Revelation chapter 1, he sees Jesus in the midst of the seven candlesticks. And you look down to verse 20 and you find out that the seven candlesticks were the seven churches. Jesus is in the midst of his church. The Bible says, not forsaking the assembling of yourselves together as the manner of some is, but exhorting one another so much the more as you see the day approaching. It says, and he gave gifts, apostles, prophets, evangelists, pastors, and teachers for the perfecting of the saints. Where do they do that? They do that in the local church, not on the radio, not in a seminar. They do it in the local church. God's people are to be faithful to it. Thirdly, holiness and living. Just a couple more verses and we're done. 1 Corinthians chapter 1. Turn to 1 Corinthians chapter 1. This is powerful. I talked about God being holy. With Him being holy, that's exactly the type of walk we're supposed to have. Look at verse 14. 1 Peter chapter 1, verse 14. As obedient children, not fashioning yourselves according to the former lust in your ignorance, but as He which hath called you is holy, so be ye holy in all manner of conversation. Because it is written, be ye holy, for I am holy. He says, you're not to to look like, be like, act like, talk like you did before you got saved. You're not to walk according to the former lust of your ignorance. It ought to change what you watch on TV. Amen. It ought to change where you go. Man, that will rule out the movie house for you. 
Amen and amen. I'd take care of going into the bars. Amen. Amen. When I did that, that was in the former lust of my ignorance. But I got saved. I'm not ignorant anymore. It's those people who keep wanting to do those things that God condemns, the things that they did before they got saved. They're the ignorant ones. That's what he's saying. And he says, here's the reason. Because God said, be ye holy, for I, the Lord your God, am holy. But when did he say that? Back in the Old Testament. He hadn't changed. He's the same. And God has the same standard of holiness for His people in the New Testament that He had in the Old Testament. He said it to the Israelites. He said it to the church. It's exactly the same because He is exactly the same. Another command, we're to win others. Go into all the world, preach the gospel to every creature. Madison Baptist Church is a lot bigger than what it was 23 years ago. We didn't do it by bringing in bands and drums. We did it by preaching the gospel of Jesus Christ and taking it to houses all around here. Winning people to the Son of God because He said, Go ye into all the world and preach the gospel to every creature. And if we stay right with God, we'll keep doing it. Whether it's popular or not, we don't care. Jesus said do it until He changes what He wrote in the Bible. We're just going to keep doing it. That's what He said to do. Jesus Christ, the same yesterday and today and forever. And if you go and hear a different Christ preach someplace, it's not the Jesus of the book. He's the same. So let me just wrap up. Let me summarize. Lost person, Jesus hasn't changed. His word hasn't changed. You still have to repent, trusting Jesus Christ as your Savior, if you want to go to heaven. Saved person... His commands to you are the same as they've ever been to the local New Testament church. A preacher may tell you not to worry about some things that he says in his word, but if I were you, I'd follow what Jesus said every time because he's always right. The same yesterday and today and forever. Let's pray. Father, we come to you in the name of the Lord Jesus. I thank you for Jesus Christ. I thank you that he is the Savior of my soul, the author and finisher of my faith. Hallelujah. And God, I pray today that you'd take your word and drive it home to hearts. Lord, you know every individual here. You know who has truly been born again and who hasn't. And Father, I pray you'd bring under conviction those without Christ, that they would come to Jesus today and receive the free gift of eternal life. It'd be a terrible thing to die and go to hell from a church pew. Be a terrible thing having heard in a church service like this that Jesus loved them enough to die for their sins at Calvary, to be raised from the dead three days later, to reject that message and die and go to hell. God, I pray they'd come to Jesus today and be saved. And God, I pray that Christians would just firmly reset in their soul their desire to obey the one who bought them, to live, to bring honor and glory to his name. Father, we'll thank you for what you do in every heart and life, for I ask it in Jesus' name.